With the election just around the corner, more and more Christians are experiencing a type of political homelessness. Today's guest is one of those people. Justin Gaboni has made it his life's work to help Christians see politics from a biblical point of view, believing that a progressive view of redemptive justice and more conservative values-based policies can go hand in hand. All right, Justin Gavoni, this is a conversation I've been looking forward to. Thanks for joining us on the Maybe God podcast. Glad to be here, Eric. Thanks for the invitation. Yes, sir. I'm glad you're here. And uh, tell us a little bit about yourself for our listeners and viewers who may not know who you are. Sure. I'm an ordained uh, minister in Atlanta, Georgia, also an attorney and a political strategist. Um, but I'm guessing I'm on here because I am the president of the AND campaign, which is a uh, Christian civic organization. All right. So, yes, let's talk more about the AND campaign. When did it start and why? So it started in earnest probably in uh, 2016. And I think what we were trying to address is what we saw as a false dichotomy or a false choice in the public square where Christians, as they entered into politics, really felt like they had to go all the way to the left, which you couldn't bring some of your orthodox convictions with you or all the way to the right, which I think the orthopraxy of the of the gospel, which is the, the conduct, the loving of your neighbor and things of, uh, of that nature, I think was wasn't fully exercised on that side. So you, you had the situation where you had justice Christians or morality Christians uh, mm-hmm. when you entered the public square. And what the AND campaign said was, well, when we read the gospel, we see Jesus caring about both. We, we see a, a, a need for justice and loving our neighbor uh, through social action in the Bible, but we also see a need for moral order because truth is truth, and our camp- our compassion can't in some way distort the truth. And so we just we thought that was a there was just a big void there, um, and it's something I experienced just being a a campaign manager and stuff like that. And so we really just wanted to address that, like how can we give Christians a, a framework that's less partisan, less ideo- ideological and more focused on Christian principles that allow us to challenge both sides. Yeah, that's a challenge, and it's a, it's a risk to step into that space because you can feel pretty politically homeless at times in a space you're trying to carve out. So mm-hmm. I imagine it came after a long season of, of discernment and discovery earlier in your life that sort of led you to, to stake this claim in the political landscape. So let's kind of go back a little bit further. And I've heard you talk a little bit about some faith struggles and questions that arose during your uh, younger years in college and the sort of Christianity you found there and how you found it lacking. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Sure. So uh, I grew up in the church. Uh, My mom's a preacher's kid. Uh, My grandfather was a a bishop in the Church of Living God. Um, So, you know, that's, that's what I knew. And when I went to college, I remember I went to Vanderbilt University, and I remember my first religious studies course. I didn't know. I thought it was going to be like a Bible study. <laughs> I didn't, you know, I just didn't. I had no idea. So I went in there, and it was really more so about kind of debunking Christianity. Uh, and at the time, I just really didn't have an apologetic. Mm-hmm. I, I found what they were offering, which was a gospel that, you know, as long as you're nice, you don't really have to follow the other the personal rules that come with individual sin. You can kind of focus on the system uh, by itself. And I found it to be convenient (laughs) at the time. Um, Mm -hmm. But as years went on and I got older, I think that cheap grace failed me. And and I began to understand. I began to run into C.S. Lewis, G.K. Chesterton, folks like that, and began to understand uh, the gospel on a a different level and began to to appreciate it and and read it more so for myself. And so... Mm. um, that changed my outlook. Uh, but yeah. at the same time, I had always had the kind of black church tradition of social engagement. Right. So I, I still was reading a lot of King, you know, listening to Gardner C. Taylor, guys like that had an impact as well. Sure. What was convenient about the, let's call it for lack of a better word, progressive Christianity that you discovered in college? Well, I could do whatever I wanted to do, right? I, I, could, I could sleep with who I wanted to, and as long as I did some community service, I was still a, a good person, right? Um, and a, as time went on, you know, it, it, became, it became harder and harder for me to reconcile that, to really believe that was okay, um, that I lived the way that I want to live instead of how God called me to live, that my life wasn't my own. And it just took some time for me to, uh, I think, admit that to myself. Yeah, I had a similar experience in college. I went, I think I'm might have gone further 
into that uh, into that hole than you did, and for longer, um, to the point where I was deconstructing to the extent mm-hmm. of like renouncing. I, I would call it renouncing Christianity. I mean, I was mm-hmm. denying things like the bodily resurrection. The only resurrection that mattered to me was the social movement that took place in the aftermath mm-hmm. of the death of Jesus, and sort right. of that's what we have to carry on is the social movement of justice and you know. Um, holiness in terms of uh, systems and society, things like that, but not yeah. in terms of, you know, my own heart. So I can yeah. relate. I can relate to that. Mm-hmm. And I'm um, glad you pulled out of it before it was, <laughs> before it was too late. However, I would say um, I still value a lot of the things that I valued at that, in that season of life. I just value it for different reasons. Mm-hmm and in a different order than I once did. Do you still find yourself holding on, holding dear to the commitment to social justice? Yeah, I think there's some things uh, on the left or from a more progressive uh, standpoint that have value. I mean, I believe in common grace. I don't think any one group has all the answers, but there's there are perspectives and people I had to, you know, thinkers I had to wrestle with that I, I think helped me out. Now, sure. again, I don't I don't think I got my understanding of of social justice from the left i think that came more from my the tradition that i came from um but just engaging different types of people uh and understanding that we're all struggling with with just the human experience the human condition Mm -hmm. and and how do we try to do that with the utmost compassion now i think the left goes too far not that they're too compassionate but goes outside the truth to do it and i think that's the the one of the primary errors, but there's something too that I think there are people on the right that can learn a lot from what the what the left is trying to get at. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. There's Jesus in it. Uh, I mean, for sure, it's uh, it's impossible to ignore. You've talked a little bit about, um, I guess, a unsettling run in with law enforcement um, during. I think it was during college uh, that sort of shook you and and brought you back a little bit to your roots. Could you talk a, bit, a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, I think there, you know, there were a series of incidents in my life as I was kind of living as I wanted to live where I I mean, I just got into trouble and I was I was going to a place of self-indulgence that continually was putting me in bad situations, Uh, whether it's binge drinking, uh, you know, all the all the things that come with kind of college life hookup culture. It um it seemed fulfilling at a time and then it became very clear that it was empty. And so it made me reevaluate. And I think this was actually when I I really came to my senses was after college. Uh, So this was, you know, this was going on during college and um, law school. Um, But I had to, you know, God brought me low. And so I I had to start dealing with how I was treating people that actually cared about me. Uh, what I was doing to myself and the situations I was putting myself in and what was I, what was my, actually my purpose? Was it just to make money and have some professional success or was there more to what God had called me to? Yeah. So you went to law school. Um, why, why did you decide to do that? You know, uh, for me, my dad had always told me that he and his father wanted to be attorneys. Um, and just never had the opportunities. Um, and so I just had always, once I heard that story, I just had always said, I'm going to be an attorney. It, it was pretty, it was really that simple for me. I, I didn't question it after that. Yeah. What was your, did you want to be a, a practicing attorney or did you have political aspirations early on? So early on, I just, I figured I'd be a practicing attorney, be in the courtroom. I mean, when I was young, I didn't really know exactly what that entailed. Would I be a litigator or would, you know, yeah. would I be doing something else? Um, and then as time went, went on, I, you know, probably when I moved to Atlanta after law school, considered getting into politics as a politician, uh, started running campaigns, you know, working with politicians. Um, and then I think the and campaign inspiration came and kind of, uh, part of my commitment to the and campaign was to say, okay, maybe movement leadership is just important as electoral leadership. Ooh. And maybe God's calling me to movement leadership. But if we're going to be honest, many of us, our advocacy ends at the ballot box. Or it stays within the ideological lines drawn by others. We've allowed our political parties to become the masters of our social action. How would you describe sort of the landscape of politics that that you first entered into? Like what what 
did you notice about the political environment at the time? Uh, I just know, I mean, the first thing that I noticed was you get, especially when you're on the kind of uh, campaign management or campaign strategy side of it, sometimes you're rewarded for being the person who who is kind of ruthless, right? Mm-hmm. And so there were some times I tell people, um, because I, I try to, I really do try to let people know I'm, I'm not coming from a perfect past or perfect position. We were some of like the first trolls. I think before trolling was even real, we would go on uh, comment sections of uh, newspapers and all that stuff and just troll like, you know, have several different names and just, you know, really? take over the comment section. As a political and strategy. Wow. Yeah, as a political strategy. Yeah. Uh, but also saying things that could be hurtful, you know, or, or to people that aren't, weren't very considerate. So I learned that you got rewarded for that because unfortunately it can be effective. And so the people sometimes who are the most ruthless or willing to do those things, um, get the better positions. And, yeah. uh, and I got into some extent, I, I kind of uh, fed into that. Right. Were you a democratic operative at the time or which side of the aisle were you on? Yeah, most of the stuff I did was Democratic stuff. Um, I'm in Atlanta. It's a, a progressive space. But I also did some stuff that wasn't as partisan. So some regional, you know, some regional things um, dealing with transportation and uh-huh. uh, those, type of res- uh, those type of issues. Yeah. You've talked a lot about something that I've, I've repeated often in my conversations, and I've appreciated the language you put around it, something you found to be a compassion conviction divide in politics. What did you mean by that particular phrase? Well, I, I think what I was saying earlier, uh, we have somehow split, separated, let me put it that way, we have separated compassion from conviction. So either my whole focus is on being compassionate, at least to the people who I think I need to be compassionate to, or my whole focus is being, you know, about convictions. And, and again, I think the latter can make you very harsh, right? If I'm just focused on convictions, then I, I maybe I'm not really considering what people are going through. If I'm I'm all about the rules and the laws and making sure that we do everything right, I can be uh, very judgmental. Uh, and I think in a condemnatory way. Um, and so that, that's just what I saw in our public square. And I saw even Christians kind of saying either I'm going all in with compassion or I'm going all in with conviction but missing the point that the beauty of the gospel was this tension that brought love and truth together was this tension that brought justice and moral order together. And while we tend to try to avoid that tension because it it can be uncomfortable, I don't think we get to do that. I don't think we get to lean in all the way uh, to justice so much that we lose the truth or that we lose our convictions or, or the, uh, or vice versa. So uh, that's what we saw. And again, that's what the end campaign was trying to, uh, in a sense, help help Christians solve. Right, right, right. I get it. And I think just for people watching and listening, when you say justice in that context, you mean social justice, compassion movements. And when you say conviction, you mean principles and beliefs and morality, yeah. correct? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And what's sad is the more you pay attention, the more you see people who I've noticed it myself. When I meet someone who leads with compassion, I think liberal. And when I meet someone who leads with principles and sort of moral rectitude, I think conservative or, you know, Democrat and Republican, or, you know, we box those sort of categories really neatly on both sides. And it's really sad to me because Jesus is both. And I think it's a, it's something you're perceiving. It's a situation where anybody who's identifying as conservative Republican is afraid to show compassion lest they be like, you know, outed as a secret liberal and vice versa. I would guess on the left, there are people who are afraid to stand up for certain issues or, um, you know, beliefs, convictions, lest they be accused of bigotry of the right. Is that, is that kind of what you're perceiving? That's right. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That's a scary place to be because we don't want we don't want conservatives who aren't (laughs) compassionate about their convictions. And we certainly don't want liberals who want to uh, pursue social justice at the expense of truth. I appreciate I appreciate where you're at with that. So what price did you pay for staking the claim you 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 did when you uh, founded the and campaign? Like, did you lose friends because you were no longer loyal? 
I didn't necessarily lose a whole lot of friends. I, I would say that I, I probably wasn't invited to as many of the, the get togethers. Um, but a lot of my friends knew how, how I felt. The people that were close to me knew this was, these had been my convictions forever. So it wasn't surprising. Um, I think on a professional level, I mean, you know, I've, I've had people who mentored me say, you know, well, you just committed political suicide mm. uh, because you can't be in this progressive space and um, maintain those those convictions and talk like that. And we know you don't necessarily want to go over all the way over to the conservative space. So what are you going to do? Um, and so that was kind of the response. I don't think I lost a lot of friends, but I certainly think there was some distance, right? I mean, uh-huh. there, you know, sometimes there was some distance between us because it's like, I like you, but I, you know, I can't necessarily take on I some of the align. things that you're talking about, uh-huh. which, which you got to count the cost, right? So none of that came uh, as a surprise. Uh, it was just, you know, what, what I was called to do. You've talked about meeting people that were afraid to do what you did, even though they agreed with you in principle um, yeah. on, you know, certain issues. What made them so afraid? Is it just the cost that they that it comes with? Yeah, it's just, I mean, if I'm in office, you know, I don't want it to get out that I actually do think being as pro-choice as the Democratic Party is today is is uh, is, is doesn't make sense, is, mm-hmm. is not good, is uh, could be even wicked. Um, or if I'm a, you know, running campaigns, I don't, you know, I know people who you would just get blacklisted. Like nobody want to use somebody who doesn't, who the donor class would see as somebody who's a liability. And that's really right. what it comes down to. Um, sure. if the donor class doesn't agree with what you're doing, then you don't have a job. And, uh, you know, I don't, that's what I was called to do. I didn't have an expectation that everybody else would actually be willing to do that. But I think what the AND campaign is trying to do is create an infrastructure, create a culture and a community to where it's easier for people to do that. But it starts with some bold people who are who are willing to say, I don't I don't have a choice. Yeah. Uh, and that's that's who we've been trying to bring together. Yeah, man. The phrase donor class, it just gives me a chill down the spine. I don't know why. I know that's reality, and I know that's where we are now. Yeah. <laughs> but it just, the idea that you or anyone, I mean, being a preacher, I understand that in principle how a donor class can, you know, potentially um, lord itself over, you know, leaders and potential leaders. Yeah. But it's still, uh, it's a scary thing to consider. And it does take some individuals of courage to step forward and sort of, step out of that system even if it comes at a cost so yeah. man i applaud you in that i know a little bit about what it's like and i know the personal cost it can uh that can come with that um what uh as we look ahead what in an election year that is gonna certainly be contentious and chaotic like what are you hoping that the end campaign and its allies can mitigate what problems can we can we potentially solve if if we followed the end campaign's philosophy going into an election year? Yeah, well, well if you look at some um, studies that have been done, there's actually a, a high chance that there'll be political violence, right? That yeah. groups on both sides will not want to accept the outcome if it is not in their favor. Right. And that, and that about, I think almost a quarter of Americans think political violence might be even necessary or justified uh, based on that. So one thing we want to do is say, hey, as Christians, not only should we not participate in this type of political violence, but let's make sure that we're responsible in our messaging so that we don't push people there. And what I mean by that is, you know, there are times, whether it was, you know, January 6th, or whether it was riots um, that were happening on the left, where I saw Christian influencers who probably didn't go out there themselves, but in their words almost implied that it was they understood and it was okay. Hmm. Uh, and that's we want to keep folks from we want to help folks see through that and not add to that. The other thing is understanding that this is not this election is important and that you should participate, but that is not an ultimate thing. That. Life will still go on and we will still have to treat our neighbor kindly. And actually what you do within your community, if you're able to organize and get people together, can be more impactful than what the person who's going to win is going to be able to do. Yeah. You still have influence. You still have a say, uh, even if it doesn't go your way. And so I think those are the primary things that we're trying to accomplish uh, 
in this election cycle. Amen. I hope you are successful in that because I don't know how much more we can take of this of this madness we've seen in the past few years. And mm -hmm. and I do pray for that uh, to that to to for what you're saying to come to pass. Um, I know when uh, we discovered you, Justin, it was uh, in our effort to learn more about a Christian response to the critical race theory controversy that has, I think, um, really become more heated in the last couple of years. I think it's after the murder of George Floyd and the subsequent riots and things that I started hearing more and more about critical race theory in the sort of common you know, conversation going on every day before I knew about it, but I didn't hear that much about it. Um, so let's spend a couple of minutes talking about that. All right. Uh, I know it's a little ironic because some of the things I heard you talking about was basically we need to talk less about this <laughs> critical race theory and talk about real racism and what's going on in the world. But we got to talk about it because everybody's we have, to, of, we have to address it. Uh, yeah. I'm so waiting. where do you start with uh, with CRT? How do you define it? If you if you could in a few words. Yeah, and I'll get that. I, I usually want to start with this to say you cannot address this issue if you do not reckon with the history of America, which just 60 years ago had laws, written laws that were racist, right? That, that treated one group as lesser than another. Sure. And that's been the case in America for longer than it's been fixed to the extent that it's fixed in the law, okay? Uh -huh. And I, I'm not one of those people that says there's been no progress. I, I definitely think there has been progress. But the first thing we have to do is start with that reality, because I think a lot of people like to jump here and there and they don't want to start with the reality that you have a group of people who are treated as less than citizens, sometimes less than human in this country longer than they've been treated with equality. Uh huh. We, we got to reckon with that. So Meaning, critical, just real quick, sorry, you're, yeah. you're saying that, um, black people in America were enslaved longer than they have been free. Is that what you're we've been enslaved or going through Jim Crow Got it. longer Got it. than we've actually been. I mean, Jim Crow ended, what, 60 years ago. It's not yeah. it wasn't that long ago. So, so yeah. I do think you have to start with that reality because it means something like it. Things just don't disappear that quickly. And I think mm -hmm. in other issues, will it be we're willing to admit that in this one? Not so much. And that, you know, it is what it is. So with that context, we have to have that historical context with that historical context. What critical theories do in general is they analyze power, right? They say, okay, here's this power. Here's how it's been abused. Here how, here's how language plays into that and all that. So just in general, on that basic idea, critical studies aren't that bad from that point, right? If you go to Amos, Amos goes into Israel. He, go, he says, look at your power. Look how, you, look how you're using your power. Yeah. You're mistreating people in the courts. You're mistreating the poor. And all these other things, right? Sure. So, that, so the analyzing power and seeing how it's used is not necessarily bad. Right. Where I think critical race theory goes off the rails a little bit is when you start getting into, number one, that everything is about an exchange of power. And so everything that happens really is just a reflection of how people want to use power. In many cases, that may be true. Everything cannot be about an exchange of power and how power is being used. Sure. The other part that I push back against when it comes to critical race theory is the racial essentialism, which basically says your race says something about your character. Your race says something about your competence. That's a lie from the mm. pits of hell. Mm. Right. Yeah. Your race. Your sex says nothing about your character, says nothing about your competence. There was a time on the left when we thought that type of stereotype was bad. Yeah. Now, somehow that type of stereotype becomes OK. So I'm more than willing to admit that critical race theory has its excesses. Right. Like I have young sons. I'm not going to teach them critical race theory. Most black people before this was made a big deal weren't didn't even know what it was. Uh -huh. And so when I say we don't we shouldn't talk about it as much, it doesn't mean that we can't address it as people need to go about it. But you had so many people talking about race before critical race theory was even the thing, whether it's Frederick Douglass, sure. Sojourner Truth. You have all these people, all these Christians talking about race. It had nothing to do with critical race theory. The issue I have, the biggest issue I have with the right on how they've done this is they created a boogeyman, which it was in some universities. Obviously, it's a kind of a legal theory and all that stuff. 
they made this huge boogeyman about it and they've tossed everything about race legitimate conversations about race into this boogeyman which is which is now happening with you know dei and all that stuff yes there's some excesses to me it's intellectually dishonest to throw every conversation about race given our historical context into that poisoned uh, well and now we can't and now every time, time i talk about race it's critical race theory yeah that's not that's to me again that's intellectually dishonest right and so that's how i've approached it and so when i say let's not talk about it as much i say i'm saying let's talk about the real issues that outside of academia people weren't even talking about critical race theory right yeah i mean uh, yeah I think I think you're right, and my, one of my favorite talks of yours that I've seen is the Gospel Coalition talk about the lies that serve us, yeah. and it was convicting because I think anyone looking to skirt the issue, the hard stuff about racism, is tempted to to do that under the guise of well, everything about race these days is critical race theory, right. you know, being shoved down our throats and. And while I agree with you, it is a problem. It is pernicious. And I do think it has trickled down to more than just the universities. I think with time, it tri it's trickled down education. You know, talk about trickle down economics. It's like trickle down education where it started in the highest levels of academia. And now it, it, it is, as an ideology, sort of trickling down to the lowest levels, kindergarten and all that stuff, where kids are learning to, you know, identify their truest selves according to the color of their skin. And I just think that is a problem. But... I do recognize, Justin, the temptation that many have and that I have some come to at times to just chalk all of what's happening today up to a critical race theory, liberal Marxist mm -hmm. agenda. So I want to I want to acknowledge that, even though I probably don't land completely where you land on this whole uh, conversation, just like I didn't land with Neil Shenvey when I, you know, I didn't agree with him on everything. I want to acknowledge that I Wait, think you don't agree with me on everything. No, man. How can can we, how we can, this, this podcast <laughs> is over. How, how can we possibly move forward? Hey, this is the and you campaign, right? Not the or campaign. <laughs> um, no, but I appreciate the intellectual honesty and consistency with which you approach, mm -hmm. um, with which you approach this. And, and I, I also appreciate your willingness to call out the left on some things. You know, there was a time I remember growing up on the left and it was a time when the aim was colorblindness. Mm hmm. You know, and the sin of racism was an individual kind of don't be a racist. You personally, individually, don't be a racist. If you can figure out how to not be a racist, you and your family, then you will have done your part to solve racism. And now it's become a different conversation. And yeah. I think there's some good and some bad in that. What do you say to somebody who says, look, I wasn't around in the late 1800s. I wasn't around in Jim Crow. I, I was born 40, 45 years ago and doing the best I can to be a good person, to you know, love all my neighbors regardless of their skin color. Um, but I didn't have anything to do with what happened before and I shouldn't be held responsible for it. Yeah. So I, I would say two things. And, and the first thing, let me address the colorblindness thing. I think, again, if, if, you know, the left was coming from a colorblind standpoint, I don't think that's the way to go either. But there's a good, healthy center bet between those two, it, between racial essentialism, colorblindness. You know, there's a, there's a healthy ground in, uh, between those two. Yeah. Um, if somebody says, I wasn't there, I would say, well, number one, anytime you're the citizen of a country and you benefit from some of the things that a country brings, you also take on its debts. Right. So if if something has happened or there's a people that's been treated a certain way within society and you're part of that society, you take on some of those you take on some of those debts. That, that's part of citizenship. It's not just what you get. There's also some things that, that come along with it. Number two, if you are a Christian, regardless of if you were responsible for it or not, love your neighbor doesn't mean love them only if you were the one that hurt them and now no if you love your neighbor and you see there are disparities and you see there are people hurting that i don't know why christians fight so hard to say well i don't, i shouldn't have to do anything because i wasn't there but you're a christian uh -huh. and even the debts of the society aside that shouldn't irk you so to think that you know what i may not be responsible for that but i want to fix it and I want to make things right, especially if if some of those um, issues are still kind of haunting society. Yeah. What do you think it is about human beings, not just Christians, but human beings that triggers that kind of response in us whenever we do receive critique yeah. from people? Um, 
who aren't like us, let's say, and yeah. it's, uh, it, it, we, we just immediately perceive it as a threat and, and push back against it without sitting with it and absorbing yeah. it. Why, why do we do that? I think, and this is a deep, deep concept, but I think the ancients called it pride, right? Uh -huh. uh, we don't like uh, to be called out. Uh, we don't like to be told anything other than the narrative that we want to hear. Yeah. Uh, and so, and that's everybody. I don't, I don't think that's one group more than any other. We all have pride, but we all have to be aware of that pride. The yeah. other thing, and I'll be, I'll be honest, is there is a sect on the left that pretends that if you are not, if, you know, if, if you don't score very highly in the, you know, kind of uh, victim Olymp Olympics, then your life is perfect. So if you're white and you grew up in a white community, you, you know, you got everything and you were just swimming in privilege and everything was great for you. Mm. And you owe this to other people whose lives weren't so great. And I think while I think the American church and while white America does have some things that it needs to correct and it has more power than a lot of other folks to correct it, that needs to happen when we act like other people don't suffer and that because they are not a minority, they didn't go through anything or I just think it makes people resentful. Now, does that mean they shouldn't do anything? No, but if we're going to be honest, you can't approach people like their life has just been perfect and they've been given everything. That's, it's just not true. Now, is there privilege? I believe privilege exists, but to what extent? And I never want to, because I, I just can't do it personally because I grew up with a very diverse group of people. I've seen people suffer. I've seen kids that were in school with me that may have been in majority culture that were treated worse than me because of their class yeah. or because of how their hair looked or because yeah. of their, their clothes. You know what I mean? So, I mean, people are suffering. And so when you approach people like that, I just think it's counterproductive. So there is some resentment because of that. That yeah. doesn't justify, in my opinion, not wanting, not feeling a, a need or even a responsibility to try to make things better on a race, mm. uh, you know, on the race issue. Yeah. What do you do with the concept of whiteness? I mean, I hear that more and more that whiteness uh, is uh, an instrument of all the world's ills yeah. and it is the great oppressor. I mean, what do you make of all that rhetoric? I think where people who say that are coming from and I, w I want to try to be uh, charitable. I think where they are com coming from is that white culture in so many ways has tried to make itself the norm, right? And so it's made other cultures, ethnic groups feel almost illegitimate or that, or that they always had to assimilate to be respected, to be worthy and valuable. So I think that's where that comes from. Mm. Now, although I think with history, there's, 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 that's true to some extent, to a large extent. Again, I don't think it justifies the excess. And so I don't really use the term whiteness a whole lot because I think it's been made it's been made into this thing that is like, you know, all powerful, all, you know, everywhere. Yeah. And I, I think that I just don't think that's helpful. And so if we're going to talk about some talk about the specific instances, but it's again, and I think it goes with what I said before, you make it into something that is actually causing you to dehumanize other people in the same way you say they dehumanized you. Right. So if I break all things that are white culture into whiteness and don't look at the people who still are dealing with the human condition, who are still and may be racist, may not be racist, may have a lot of privilege, may not have so much privilege. I can't treat them just as political abstract. I can't make them a character and then treat them like that. So right. although some of that history might be true, it still doesn't justify treating people in that way. Mm -hmm. um, so, again, it's, it's the excess. It's always seeing an issue and overcorrecting. And I yeah. think in this culture war, that's the story of, of, of who we are and what we've been doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I think that, you know, race, uh, what I hear you saying, I think, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but that it should be considered one of many variants in, in analyzing, you know, privilege and, and power and life. Like, it's not the only issue that we should, not the only lens we should be looking through. There's other lenses too that contribute to the whole. Now you might consider race or skin color to be a, a bigger part of the whole than other issues, but there are other issues. I mean, certainly economics has to be in the issues that we consider. Uh, I mean, if you're born poor, doesn't matter what your skin color is, you're going to be at a disadvantage. If you're born to a single parent household, 
same kind of situation. And so sometimes I, f I feel like, this is just me here, I, I feel like we are culturally, we're exalting the race component um, uh, over and above the others, or at the expense of the others in our conversations. Does that resonate with you at all? Yeah, I think it, it does. In one era, we have people who don't want to consider race at all because it's inconvenient for the history of the country. It's inconvenient for the position that they're in. So they don't want to say anything has anything to do the, with race. And then you have people who say everything has to do with race and don't consider, which I think race matters. I think it's very significant based on the laws of this country and the history of this country. But if you don't, if you refuse to look at class, if you refuse to look at all these other uh, factors, um, you're just not being intellectually honest. You're, you're more so concerned about making sure that your argument has a ironclad narrative, like a perfect narrative, instead of saying there's nuances here. Yeah. And guess what? Nuances, it's hard to put nuances on a bumper sticker. All right? It's yeah. hard to get people enraged when you have to, oh, yeah, let me add this nuance to it. No, I want to give you the cleanest narrative I can, right? The most straightforward narrative I can, and right. that way I can manipulate you with it. And uh -huh. that's, I think, too, too often our, our knowledge broker, so to speak, uh, I think they do that. What do you say to somebody who, um, when you talk about the need to talk about racism in America today, what do you say to somebody who says, look, man, you um, had a great family upbringing. I suppose you had you very athletic, played football, successful, Vanderbilt University, law school, you know, like you're doing pretty well for yourself. Like we're over it now. America's healed. It's better now. And you're the, you're the shining example. What do you, what do you say to that argument? Yeah, I would say number one, um, we have made progress. So that's why I don't sit here and say it's, you know, it's, you know, America's all terrible. It's all bad. We've done nothing. We've come nowhere again. I don't think that's intellectually honest, but you also don't want to take the exception because if you look at the average black man and, 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 you look at the uh, rate of imprisonment and all these other things. You don't just take me and say, oh, this is what everybody, everybody didn't have the opportunities that I, that I had. Mm -hmm. um, and so I can realize I had those opportunities and go to my community and say, no, it is possible. But that doesn't mean I ignore the disparities and the suffering and, and everything else that goes with it. It's the, it's the nuance of the, it's, it's being honest and saying, no, it can happen. Yeah. It, my narrative would be stronger if I said, well, it could never happen. And then you would say, well, what happened to you? And you, I look at some people and they say the same thing. But I have to, I have to realize that it can happen. But you got to look at what's going on in the community beyond me. I'm, I'm in, in a way, somewhat of an exception within that. And I think some people take that exception and say, well, it must be easy. There must be no problems. Again, sure. um, I think it's more complicated than that. Yeah. Another argument I'll hear a lot in bringing up race among white people. I mean, I'll just kind of lay it out there. All right, here we go. So what I what I'll hear a lot behind closed doors is like, look, it's not a racism problem. Um, it's a culture problem. Black folks have a culture problem in America, and it's evidenced by the fact that other cultures that are minority cultures are excelling even beyond that of white people, you know, in terms of their measurables of success, Asian, some Asian populations, uh, Indian populations, Jewish populations in America, in many ways are outperforming white populations. And so how can we claim racism rather than just looking to culture and we need to fix culture, especially fatherlessness in homes and things like that? Yeah. Uh, where does that? I'm sure you've heard this. So where does that land with you? Again, it completely ignores the historical context. And that's what I, I mean, you can't take that many years of oppression. Um, you know, one of the way I put, one of the ways I put it is that a lot of people who ignore race don't understand in the ways that America crippled black people and then complained, you know, it broke our leg and then complained that we had a limp. Uh -huh. Yeah. yeah there, there, there's some things that every culture has to deal with. I can point at things and say, you know, white culture has some issues it has to, has to deal with too, but I'm not, I can't ignore the history. So, so one thing I would add is within that, uh, narrative, please honestly factor in the history and how that plays into it. Yeah. And if you look at that, if you look again, Jim Crow wasn't that long ago, like people were getting shot, people were getting hung and you had people, take their kids to go watch them 
as as people were hanging from trees yeah. 60, 70 years ago. Now, that's somebody's culture, too, right? And so that has an impact as well. <laughs> that's somebody's but, culture, too. That's a good line. I say that to I say, so I, I would never look at that without the historical context, without looking at the laws and uh-huh. what was going on at that time. Because every time the black people tried to do something, it was taken away. Uh-huh. So whether it was riots, burning down Black Wall Street, that stuff matters. Like when, when every time you try to do something, somebody takes it away and destroys it. Yeah. It has an impact on you. Sure. Now, that being said, if we can accept that context and, and how that might play into somebody's psyche or in, into the understanding of a community, then we can say, yes, culture matters for everybody. And if we look at if we look at um, some white cultures who are lower class they're having the same issues with yes. fatherlessness. That's they're right. having the same issues with drug use. So do we just want to point the finger at everybody and say, no, it's actually your fault. I had nothing to do with it. Or are we going to say, no, culture matters. But how does these, how do systems and how does other things play into other people's culture? It doesn't mean that you have to excuse them. I certainly don't. But are we trying to understand or are we just trying to get a pass not to do anything? Uh-huh. So for me, as a Christian, it's like, how am I evaluating the culture and how am I using that to help my narrative or actually to help people and figure out and find solutions? Yeah. Some might say, hey, I agree with you in principle, but it seems to me historically that government intervention doesn't n- fix this problem. That in many cases, you could say it's made it worse. You know, like some, some would say the Civil Rights Act or some other um, tertiary laws that were passed sort of created a dependency um, on governmental aid that led to increased fatherlessness in homes or that um, crime bills meant to keep uh, black communities safer ended up being doing contributing to I mean greatly to fatherlessness fatherlessness in the home and and mass incarceration and so I mean folks who say that would say we need to keep the government out of this and let this culture, these people sort of find their way and, and, you know, as much as compassion as we want to have, um, the answers that many on the left are seeking are not the answers we really need. What, What do you say to that? So I would say number one, I think, I think government has a role to play. Again, if you look at Jim Crow, if it wasn't for the federal government stepping in, it wouldn't have ended. There's nothing that shows me even the church was going to be able or try or had the willingness to stop it. So government yeah. obviously, play, obviously plays a role. I don't think anybody's ever heard me say the government's going to fix it. Uh-huh. Um, so when I say you need to do something about it, I'm not necessarily, I would rather the church do something about it uh-huh. because I think government is very cumbersome. Now, I'm not against a healthy government, but I don't know that anybody's ever heard me say that government is the answer. Right. Uh, I, I don't see government that way. I've worked in government. I see, I see some of the things that it can bring to the table. But at the the same time, I know it's limitations because I've been close enough to it. And a lot of people that have to be dependent on the government, which they didn't have to be. You want to sit there. I mean, if you know the inefficiencies, you want to sit there and wait for some somebody in government to make sure that you get um, the the uh, the food that you need or make sure that you get seen by a doctor in enough time. No, you Mm. think people like doing that? Yeah, they don't. So, yes. Government has a role to play. I've never said government will fix everything. And we've seen that there are unintended consequences when it comes to policy. All this stuff plays a role. I would rather see the church play a more, more robust role. What uh, role what would that, that be? Looks like we could Joseph. talk about. Yeah, I'd Go love ahead. to hear more about it. For example, you know, I've got a guy I really look up to in ministry. His name is Matt Chandler. You may be familiar, pastor in Dallas area. And he took a lot of heat for once saying at a conference, I believe, he said, you know, if at this point I'm trying to diversify our staff, if some, if, if I, if I had a, an Anglo eight and an African-American six or seven, I can't remember exactly what numbers he used. So pardon me, but he said, I'm going to take the African-American six or seven mm-hmm. in the name of diversifying our staff. And everybody was, you know, he, you can imagine the kind of um, blowback he got uh, for that. He might, he might never live that down in some circles. Um, is that sort of what the spirit of what you're asking for, what you're hoping for, working for? I don't know if that's exactly where I was going, but I understand where he, where he was coming from. I mean, I, I think this goes into the whole, you know, in affirmative action conversation uh-huh. uh, and realizing that sometimes the only reason somebody's seems like a six 
It's because they hadn't gotten the opportunity to be the, the eight. And sometimes you do have to make opportunities. Again, this is where the left can go f- way too far and start discriminating against Asians and all that other stuff. Uh-huh. But I think there is space to say, given some opportunity, if we really carry, care about merit, maybe we give this person a chance to show their merit. Yeah. Um, and knowing that it, if it comes out of a community that didn't often have those chances, does that sound super pleasant for somebody who's on the other side of it? I understand that it doesn't. Uh, is it necessary in some situations? I can see where it is. Uh, I wouldn't make that uh, the general rule for everything we've done. I think we've seen what happens on the left when, when we do that. But I think it's an exception that uh, is, is a valuable one. Uh huh. And most people, for me, I've never seen affirmative action to mean you just put, put a bunch of people who aren't qualified in positions. I, I just, I've never seen it like that. I've been a, I've been a, uh, a beneficiary of affirmative action. And I think I do pretty well once I got, you know, got the opportunity. So I, I don't see it as a whole bunch of sixes going into a position where they need to be a 10 and we're just giving them a chance. I, I don't see it that way. I think it's giving people an opportunity who are qualified and right. may just need some extra help. Yeah. Interesting. What else in terms of what the church can do uh, comes to mind? What do you hope to see from churches? Yeah, I mean, I think outreach. I think you you have a lot of churches who have a lot of resources. And I think those resources can go to helping communities, whether it's education, you know, whether it's clothing, food, whatever, making a stronger effort to say, hey, we want to help. And not as saviors, not coming and let us tell you exactly what to do and we change everything and have all these strings attached, but being helpful to people in the community who have been doing, doing those things and showing support. Yeah. Uh, I would love the church. I would, you know, I believe in mediating institutions. I think mediating institutions are a lot more effective in many ways than government can be in a lot of different spaces. Right. The church qualifies for that, and I would love to see the church be ro- mo- more robust in in some of its outreach and the sharing of of resources. Got it. Yeah, I'm I'm convicted. I, I'm one of those churches. I lead one of those churches with a lot of resources, and we're just getting started. And you know, the future will tell, like whether we put our money where our mouth has been. But uh, I appreciate you lifting that up. Um, in a, a prior conversation I had with Neil Shinvey, who is an anti-CRT uh, advocate, let's say, um, a Christian man of faith, probably with whom you and I would find, you know, very much agreement on the things that matter most. He says we should stop looking at racism as a systemic issue. And I know we've sort of talked around this topic already, but what do you think is the problem with seeing racism now as just an individual problem, person to person problem and not a systemic one at all? And he would say, by the way, based on the fact that there those laws that were systemically racist no longer are on the books. Yeah, so I know this is going to sound like a broken record, but we can just say it's, it's consistency on my part. Go for it. It ignores the historical context. So you're telling me that for hundreds of years, people can be discriminated against. And then 60 years after that, it has no impact. When we talk about the spirit of America, we talk about a spirit that comes from the Revolutionary War and all that, and that it carries over. But somehow, none of the racism carries. Only the good things carry over. Sure. None of the bad things ever carry over, even though we can see that in disparities. So, yeah. so what I'm telling you is when you compare African Americans to people who came here on their own accord, you're missing something. Uh-huh. Because I can't tell you how many times when black people did make progress, it was deliberately shut down. Sure. I believe What that. do you think it does to a people to be enslaved and go to Jim Crow and then create something like Black Wall Street and have it burnt down. You're right. What does that do? What does that, what impact do you think that has? And if Neil wants to tell me that that has no impact, it means nothing because it's not in the law, then I would say that's intellectually dishonest or allow me to educate you on why that's inaccurate. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now, do some people take it too far? Sure. But to say it disappeared when nothing else disappears, that's not counter to our neg- narrative yeah. is, I think, uh, wrong. Yeah. To Neil's credit, I think he would acknowledge that past is very painful. 
and something the African American community in America is still re recovering from, for sure. But he would say the word systemic racism is dishonest if the systems being called racist are technically no longer racist as they stand in the books today. So, so if somebody was, let's say they're growing up during Jim Crow, they've believed in that their whole lives, suddenly it's gone from the law. Them and their circle of, of, of maybe good old boys, you could say it is, they're totally not, you know, they, they're not going to have any impact on the system. Their uh -huh. biases and their control of the system and their positions in the system sim sure. somehow just completely go away because it's not in the law anymore. Uh -huh. Again, I just, I don't think that's how humanity works. I think it's convenient if I want to be colorblind and forget about it. It sounds good. Yeah. But I also think we can look at some of the disparities and say, that's actually not how it works. And how? we 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 shouldn't be so naive to think that that it all just blows away. How will we know when we're no longer systemically racist or when systemic racism has is no longer an issue? I think there's a number of factors. I mean, we, we can look at disparities. Uh, we can look at we can look at race relations. Um, that's something that we, we can sit down and really and really work on. But as of right now, if we look at several different factors, that's it's hard to tell me that you know, it's hard to look at uh, maternal mortality. It's hard to look at a lot of the educational issues. And unless, you know, some people may just think um, still that certain minds are of a lesser quality. But these are these are issues that that matter. And I don't think we should sweep them under the rug. Yeah. Uh, and again, I don't, it does, I mean, it's cute that, you know, somebody say, well, I acknowledge the past. Well, great. You can read history. If you don't acknowledge that it could have some impact today, I don't think that's, I don't think that's realistic or honest. Uh -huh. um, so I'm not looking for a pity. Um, I think I, I want a realistic view of how what happened in the past impacts what happens today. Past okay. is prologue. We know that for everything else except the things we don't want to know it for. Mm. Uh, and that's my, that's my issue. Um. I know if I don't ask this question, people will say, why didn't you ask this question? So uh, to what extent are you advocating for reparations as part of the answer to the problem of systemic racism? Um, I, I, don't, I wouldn't say it's the core of my ministry. Uh, I think according to biblical principles, it makes sense that if your father stole some land from my father and gave it to you, then it probably doesn't belong to you. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think, I don't think that's hard to understand. At one point our government did understand it and that's why it was promised, uh, uh, to us and it, it didn't happen. So, uh, do I see it as something that is forthcoming? Not necessarily, but I won't, I won't ever say that it doesn't make sense based on, uh, the history of what's happened. Okay. Okay. Um, final question for me, and then I'll ask if you have a question for me, uh, if you'd like to talk about anything else and, um, we'll go from there, but, what do you think it means in 2024 uh, for Christians to bring our Christian witness to, to whatever political discussions we're having? Like to what extent? And, you know, I, I get pushed back when I get too religious, too Christian. And, you know, mm -hmm. the separation of church and state argument is always one that comes up. I don't think people really understand what it means. <laughs> but but um, to what extent should we bring Jesus to these conversations? I mean, it has to be the core of what we're doing. And that's why the AN campaign talks a lot about the compassion and conviction of Christ. Does that mean that we're throwing Bibles at people's heads? I don't think so. But it does have an impact on how we hear people, yeah. how we value their opinions. Uh, I, think, I think Christians should have a deep understanding of respecting what people have to say and thinking that all people can potentially make a contribution to society. It's just based on the human, you know, human dignity, the Imago Dei, right? The image of God in us gives us a, a certain worth. Mm -hmm. And we should understand, and this is my opinion, that I don't think any group of people is fit to lord over others without that group, other group's uh, contribution. We've just proven over and over again, if we don't have equal representation, if we don't think we need to advocate for other people, then we, we end up hurting them. And that's just kind of our brokenness. Mm -hmm. uh, so when we look at democracy, uh, you know, I look at it like Frederick Douglass do, did. While it was very imperfect, there was some promise in that, 
that kind of connected to valuing the agency and dignity of others. And that's one of the things I would have us focus on um, in this election. And, and, and to add to that, never allowing anybody to be seen as a political abstraction. Never say, oh, you're just a Democrat. Oh, you're just a white male Republican. That's your whole story. That is the quickest way to become a monster uh, mm -hmm. when you dismiss people and what they may be going through uh, like that. So uh, don't let allow people to be just seen as political abstractions. Mm. Amen. It's a good word. Um, thank you for that. Is there uh, is there anything else you want to uh, you, you feel like we need to talk about or you want to ask me any questions? How are you? I don't know how you're doing. No, I'm good, time. man. I thought this was a pretty robust uh, conversation. We made the most of our time mm -hmm. today. That's good. I feel the same way. Um, if folks who are watching or listening wanted to find more about you and, and uh, track your, your work and your progress, how would they do that? So you could uh, listen to the Church Politics Podcast, uh, and that comes on a, about once a week where we talk about uh, politics and culture from a, a biblical point of view. Uh, you could go to uh, Instagram or I guess it's X now and go to at A&D campaign or at Justin E. Gibney and just uh, see some of our content. And if you go to our website and you can become a part of Civic Revival, which is our 20, 2024 initiative to do many of the things that I talked about today. And I also have some resources for the church. So awesome. Well, Justin, thank you so much for joining us on the Maybe God podcast today. I'm really grateful. My pleasure. Thanks for having me.